Hello and welcome everyone to the Cyverse webinar series. I'm Tina Lee, Cyverse's User Engagement Officer, and today's webinar is a technology preview of MLflow. It's a, used, a software application that's used to manage the machine learning workflow. As our presenters today are Artin Majdi and Aryan Zare, both doctoral students at the University of Arizona. As many of you know, Cyverse is a cyber infrastructure project funded by the US National Science Foundation. And this free webinar series helps fulfill a key part of our mission to train scientists on how to use Cyverse's computational resources. So I'm gonna cover housekeeping really quickly and then we'll start the webinar. Today's presentation is approximately 30 minutes. Please keep your audio muted and open the chat window um, where you can type any questions you have for Artin or Aryan to answer after their presentation. Uh, the video recording of this webinar and any other important links will be posted on our website later for you to review at any time. In addition to these webinars, Cybers offers focused workshops on open science skills and container technology. Please visit our website learning pages for more information on these workshops and on our resources that can help you learn and teach using Cybers. Uh, we've also recently launched the Discovery Environment 2.0. It's the same great workspace that you've become addicted to, but with a new user interface and even more functionality for doing your science. So please check it out and let us know with your feedback how it's going. So before I introduce our presenters, um, I just wanted to mention if you're interested in using MLflow and Cyverse to manage your collaborative machine learning projects, you'll need to request something called an External Collaborative Partnership or ECP. ECPs enable users to get dedicated support from our staff to help you get your project to the next level. So uh, Artin and uh, Ariane will cover this briefly and I'll post the link in the chat. So let me please uh, present Artin Majdi. He is a graduate assistant at the University of Arizona's Data Science Institute and a doctoral candidate in the electrical and computer engineering department. His areas of research include image analysis and processing, machine learning data and model uncertainty, advanced neural networks, and machine learning lifecycle management. Ariane Zare is pursuing his PhD in computer science here at the University of Arizona, and he is a key team member of the Fido Oracle team. We did a, a, a webinar about Fido Oracle last uh, fall. Ariane is helping design uh, the machine learning, computer vision, and statistical models for the geocorrection and stitching of high resolution RGB image data for Fido Oracle. So, welcome, Martin. Welcome, Ariane. Thank you, Tina. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this webinar. I hope uh, you find these materials that we discussed today useful. Um, as you know, today we'll look at what ML Lifecycle, ML Lifecycle Managers are and how one of their open source ones, which is MLflow, can be used to help with our common ML practices. There will be two case studies to demonstrate this practicality, which one is the chess extra classification, which I'll be using just to showcase some examples while talking, going through the technical review. And then Ariane will explain how MLflow helped him with their FIDO Oracle project. So some personal experience. I guess. A lot of domains are moving to ML uh, to automate their work. You've, you've seen that in the past few years, um, ML has been exploding and that's phenomenal. But most of these, most of uh, experts in these domains aren't fully aware of the terrifying path that lies ahead. Uh, and why is, why is that? When I first started with ML, I followed the traditional academic practices of writing some code on my own running it on some supercomputer like HPC, and then experimenting with the final model as most people do. This seems in order, right? But it, I would have said yes, uh, maybe a year ago, but now that I've had some more exposure to MLflow and our lifecycle managers, my answers would be a definite no. Just imagine, this, is, this happened to me this multiple times. I'm sure this has happened to you. If you've done some ML work, that you work on a project for about a year, you end up with hundreds or thousands of experiments at your disposal, 
but how do you want to keep track of all of that, right? You can't predict what you will end up with a year into the project unless you had years of experience. And even then, I doubt it'll be that simple. And this is what happened to me uh, almost. I finished this brain segmentation project feeling, God, I'm, I'm putting an end to Alzheimer's disease. And not really. I spent a few months writing the paper and simultaneously ran some more experiments for the results section. With terabytes of data sitting in my machine, we submitted the paper. We waited a few months, got a revision. One of the reviewers asked us for a plot that required us to replicate one of the very old experiments. But how are we supposed to find the model corresponding to that experiment, which we did not think would be useful today? And what was its parameters? We did find it, but it was not a pleasant pleasant experience when dealing with the absurd number of simulations. And, and obviously when I'm talking about this kind of projects, I'm not talking about performing some basic machine learning on existing data sets. That's easy. Don't waste your time with MLflow. Just go write uh, some simple code and you'll be done. You'll be good to go. But that's not how grad school and academia work. What we are expected to do should be on the cutting edge of ML techniques or applications. Otherwise, you can't publish it. Your department won't even look at it. And if you want to use this for your startup, for your uh, smaller company, given that the company usually rather have their own platforms, is still there's a lot, a lot of merits into using things like MLflow, which I'll be, which we will go be going through. Uh, throughout this uh, webinar, we'll, we'll uh, uh, sort of go over the typical challenges of ML development and show how MLflow can help with each of those or some of those. And then Ariane will explain how MLflow facilitated their uh, FIDO Oracle project. Um, there, are, there is this standard uh, model ops or ML ops that uh, specifies some attributes that must be met by most professional ML project. This is not, the, what I'm, I have here is not exact breakdown of the categories. It's more of a layman's interpretation, but uh, it, it is useful to go through this uh, sort of simplified version of it. We always have data. It must be distributed so that it does not favor one or more groups, which is becoming more and more of a challenge and we are realizing it now in the past year or so. It requires pre and post processing and must be accessible to all team members. Then you move to development. You need to design the architecture and the system or the system, making sure it is reproducible and platform agnostic. Take care of your model versioning and tracking for not only your experiments, but also for all the corresponding parameters and code dependencies and so much more. So what are the challenges? As I said, data, optimization, experimentation, collaboration, and platform dependence. These are the challenges. How MLflow can help. First off, data accessibility. Well, unfortunately, MLflow doesn't help there. There is one way that you could uh, get some, well, not with the accessibility necessary, but with the pre and post-processing step, if instead of running your processing and then write your data into storage, instead you use pipelines, then you could just add pipeline as part of your code and then everybody would have access to that, can modify it and can use it uh, in real time. Then there's model optimization and experimentation. MLflow can do a miracle here. In our life cycle managers, we focus on MLflow because it's the open source one. Obviously, we don't want to go with the Facebook one or the Google one because we don't have access. Even if we did, they have tuned those to their own needs and a lot of more other challenges. Um, this tracking uh, step has been the most beneficial aspect for me because of the story that I told you. With tracking, we can track and save and log all the parameters and package dependencies 
even the, mod, the optimized model and the artifacts. One of the other benefits of MLflow is it, that it helps with collaboration. Right now, most teams have to rely on things like GitHub, Bitbucket, and something like Gitflow. But playing with you know, commit requests is pull requests is not easy. And also keeping track of who, who said what in their commit and how to interpret that is very frustrating. Um, using things like MLflow can make that much, much easier. It still works with GitHub and Bitbucket, but it also adds and logs a lot more information that could help us to be more organized. It, it is designed to work with most ML languages, Python, R, Java, and so on. If you use its server capability, it works with multiple different SQL flavors. It can easily be integrated into existing projects, and it is designed to give us a platform agnostic model. And when you optimize your model, obviously I am saying platform agnostic, but there is an extent to it. Obviously you can load your 500 layers model on Apollo 11 supercomputer. I, I seriously doubt that would work. So to break the ML flow components, it has right now five main components. Um, there's tracking, as I mentioned, models which saves your uh, final model in a standardized way. So that for example, you could train it in Python and then load it in R, or you could uh, load it in any other versions of Python, you know, for example. The project uh, sort of uh, saves the package dependencies and uh, entry points and ways for the you know, downstream users to be able to use those or your teammates. Then there's a model registry, which we don't use much in academia, but that is a very helpful thing. For example, in my case, when I finished that project and my PI wanted to be able to use that for his own practice, but then I had to do everything manually for him. But if I, if he had access to a model registry like MLflow, we could easily click on one of the model that we select and then it was good to go. Everybody could just curl their input into that model, which is uh, running on some remote server and then get their output. And then plugins is just to be able to use your final software through pip or app get. One of the other aspects of MLflow, which is very obvious, is it's domain independent. Like look at our two case studies. One example is the classification of chest x-rays using public data sets. The other is plant disease segmentation using a manually labeled and curated data set. Uh, both use Keras and Python in this case. There are obviously different package dependencies depending on the uh, needs. And both can take advantage of uh, GPUs in HPC or you know, that that's not necessarily uh, dependent on HPC, it could be any other server. Uh, so here it's the sort of, uh, after you incorporate MLflow and then run your experiments, this is how the UI will look like. As, as you can see to the left, you could, this whole UI is run against one database in Postgres, for example, which I reused. And that one database, let's call it ChessDB for this specific UI. To the left, you see the different experiments that you have. One, for example, in this case was for local dependence, the other were hyperparameter tuning, and then when you go inside that experiments, you see a list of simulations that is drawn. Two, for example, was to find the loss function. The other ones to measure uncertainty and some to measure some other parameters, maximum samples. Two of them was drawn against NIH database. The other ones were Chexpert and a lot more information. So when I click in one of these simulations, then I go inside and get access to a lot more data. For this is one of the simulation, for example, it is run on April 13th. It was run by the main.py. This is the exact git commit hash that if you wanted to reproduce, you could use this. And if instead of you running it locally, if you run it directly from GitHub, it also saves a command code that you could just run it on any machine. And then as long as you have Docker installed, MLflow installed, 
or if you're more comfortable with a, a Kanda instead of Docker, Kanda Animal Flow, this thing will automatically save, create the environment and then run the, run the model on your input with these exact parameters. To the right, you see all the parameters that are saved and to the left down, there are all more artifacts, which we discussed. It has the model saved and you could add to some more artifacts, which Arian, I will show you some of these artifacts that he needed for his work. And also if you're concerned with the convergence and all those other things, there are some metrics that you could simply click on and show, show the progress throughout the, the epochs. And then if you decided that this model is one of your finalized one, you could just simply click on register model and push it to your, your registry. How to log it and incorporate it into your code is very easy. Simply you could, after uh, adding some few codes to specify your server, remote server and artifact storage, you could simply use ML for the log param or log metric or model or log artifact. However, because MLflow is obsessed with making our life easier, they also have this other uh, attribute this called autolog, which has for all of their uh, sort of flavors, Keras, TensorFlow, and so on, which will save all these main parameter metrics, obviously not other artifacts that might not be typical of uh, model optimization, but the ones that are typical, the ones that Keras produces, it can automatically save those. And so you don't need any of these lines of code. The ML for project component, which I said, is just this. It's one YAML file, has a name, has the environment, which uh, specify the package dependencies. It could be a YAML file for the Conda, or it could be an image for Docker environment. And then some entry points so that the downstream users or your uh, the teammate, if you wanted to use that, they know exactly how to run this, or they could just use the default uh, parameters and values. Then this is the model registry. When you click on model registry, your model will come here. And then you yourself or your PI can decide if they want to move that to staging and production. And also you don't have to limit yourself to one model. It could be multiple. It could be one for classification, like MNIST classification. I took this from an older project, a different database. The other one could be classifying something and so on. Um, how, so this is Cybers webinar, right? And I'm sure you all should be familiar with Cybers if the, with the fact that you are here and you, you found out about this webinar. Cybers has a lot of infrastructure that can come very handy for us. And you don't necessarily need to just use one. You could just mix and match, use one for tracking, the other one for artifact storage. For example, you could use uh, their cloud native service, Kubernetes cluster and whatnot, for, and so on for your optimization and tracking system. You could use same system for your uh, artifact, or you could use their data store for artifact, saving the artifacts. Or you could use the data store for your data sets. And there are many DE vice toolings for custom notebooks that come handy, like Flask, Python Desk, or R Shiny. The MLflow itself supports multiple different flavors of SQL, MySQL, SQLite, and Postgres, and also different methods to uh, transfer your artifacts and, uh, and model, which is also considered a modifact. It is through FTP, SFTP, which I'm using here, NFS or HDFS. And it also, it can easily be uh, used with Amazon Azure or Azure or Google Cloud and other famous cloud services. Uh, so Aryan will continue with the rest of this presentation. Thank you, Artin. And, um... Thank you everyone for being here. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, I hope you can all see my screen. Again, uh, yeah. thank you for, for, for being here. And uh, thank you, Artin, for uh, your detailed explanation on MLflow. 
So uh, in this section uh, of the webinar, I'm going to explain about uh, one of the uh, cases studies that we had on using MLflow with one of the projects, um, one of the machine learning projects that we had with Fight Oracle. Before going into the details of uh, using MLflow, I'm gonna explain a little bit about Fight Oracle itself. So Fight Oracle is a uh, joint project with the Danforth Center and the School of Plant Science at the University of Arizona, Data Science Institute, and Cybers. It is funded by Department of Energy, and the goal of this plan is to basically um, analyze, uh, the, the goal of this project, sorry, is to analyze the plants in draw the stress conditions. So for the plant scientists, it is really important to find um, the correlations between the genetics or the genomics and the phenomics of these plants. It also is important for them to detect different disease and find the relation uh, between the emergence of those disease and the genetic factors uh, of the plants. And the last but not the least, um, it is very important and crucial for them to have um, predictive models of those plants. So in order to accomplish those goals, um, they uh, designed and manufactured this large machine, which is actually the world's largest high throughput phenotyping machine. And they uh, basically, this machine is located in Maricopa, Arizona, and it scans um, a two acre field day and night using five plus different cameras and sensors. So here on this slide, you can see a moving image or a GIF on top um, that shows this machine. It has three axes of motion, <clears throat> excuse me, and it goes uh, from south to north, west to east, and there is this camera box that uh, all these sensors are, are mounted on that box. So on the bottom, you can see different examples of these uh, sensors and the images that we have. We have RGB, we have thermal or FLIR, uh, fluorescence images, 3D laser scanners, and hyperspectral uh, images. There are also lots of other sensors that they basically log the environment uh, condition. And um, using all those information, the scientists are looking for finding meaningful relationships. So if you're interested in this um, um, project and you want to know more about that, as Tina mentioned, um, Cybers had a previous webinar on Fight Oracle and the way that we um, manage um, this project, store the data and analyze it. So if you're interested, you can go to uh, this link and the link that is uh, also posted in the chat. So as, as I said, uh, one of the goals uh, in Fight Oracle is to detect disease and track them um, and basically uh, find the correlations between those disease and the emergence of them and the genetic factors of the plants. One of the uh, uh, very interesting disease that um, the scientists in this project are looking for and they're interested in is charcoal dry rot. So this charcoal dry rot is a fungal disease uh, that is uh, specific to sorghum. Uh, and it is uh, it usually happens uh, for the sorghum plants, for the grain sorghum plants, that they are in a water uh, stress condition. Uh, this is caused by a, a pathogen called Macrophomina fasciolina, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. And basically this fungus uh, causes the uh, tissue of the leaves of these grains or them to die and it converts their color from green to um, light gray or yellow as you can see in the picture and usually this uh, effect starts from the tips of the leaves it goes backward to the main stem so the goal of the um, like this small sub project is basically um, to detect this disease basically in those images we want to semantically uh, segment the image into the regions that they are affected by these fungus and the regions that are healthy. And um, for scientists and for farmers, it is really important to detect this disease as soon as possible and apply fungicides to prevent uh, the growth of these uh, uh, fungal disease. So um, what we are doing right now is to train different neural network models uh, for semantic segmentation. And at the end of the day, once we found the best model, 
we want to deploy that model on a drone and that drone is going to fly over the field detect um, those regions that they are affected um, by this fungal disease and gives us at the end of the flight a heat map that basically locates those uh, affected regions and the farmers can um, apply fungicides either by hand or uh, by deploying another drone. Uh, to start this project, we collected 1,400 images um, using handheld cameras. Um, there's a specific reason that we didn't want to use the gantry images. Uh, and the gantry, I guess I forgot to mention, is the name of that uh, large machine that we have. Um, and uh, we labeled those 1,400 images uh, using this great website called Labelbox. And I uh, suggest anyone who's uh, doing uh, supervised machine learning, uh, I suggest them to uh, go there um, and um, take a look at this website. It is a very useful tool for labeling images. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> why we really use MLflow um, in this project? So I wanna start by uh, an example, an analogy, uh, which is the uh, the, no the notion of cottage industry. Uh, imagine that you have um, a small business. You wanted to start uh, your own small business from your home, and you want to um, create these small uh, uh, baskets. So uh, you're going to be uh, limited in terms of how many baskets you can make during the day because these are handcrafted baskets, and it takes you a couple of hours to make each of them. So if the demand is high, um, you cannot do uh, much yourself and you need to ask other people, your friends to help you with this. And since you're doing this from your home, uh, we cannot have lots of people helping you. And if you wanna ask your friends to help you, you're gonna train them. There's gonna be this overhead between you and your friends, uh, like chatting back and forth, talking about different aspects, if they have a question and so on and so forth. So at the end of the day, um, adding more people to your project, your small business is not gonna increase your capacity of production. Uh, and there's gonna be a point at which adding more people is gonna reduce your um, uh, production rate because, uh, because of all those overheads and, and things like that. So um, the, uh, the, basically the, the, the solution for you is to um, auto make your whole process automate, automatic. And um, you need to add, you basically need to industrialize your business. And the same analogy um, applies to uh, MLflow, uh, sorry, to machine learning uh, training and uh, projects. So when we are doing machine learning, usually we are dealing with a, a huge team of people. A lot of people are gathering data. A lot of people are labeling them. Some people are working on the models. They are hyper parameter tuning. Um, they are saving different things. They are designing new experiments. And at the end of the day, some of them are using the models for the, uh, the real project. So uh, if you don't uh, do any of the management stuff like MLflow, you just want to do this by hand it's gonna be um, a headache for you. So before knowing MLflow, I was doing this manually. I had a, um, on a storage, I had different directories and subdirectories for storing experiments. I had some JSON files, some spreadsheets. They were helpful to some extent, but when the scale of the project uh, goes up, they're not gonna be uh, enough for you to manage and keep track of everything. So MLflow, as Artin mentioned, is a very great tool for uh, simply keeping track of your experiments, comparing different results together, and uh, designing new experiments, uh, deploying your model. And the most importantly, in my opinion, uh, is that at the end of the day, you want to be reproducible. Uh, you want your research to be reproducible and reusable for other researchers. So MLflow is very beneficial for that. Uh, Artin. Uh, mentioned uh, the reason and um, yeah that's uh, that's pretty much it so here at this point I'm gonna show you a live demo of Camelflow if everything helps you here um, okay 
so uh, this is the um, the main UI, the user interface of MLflow uh, that Artin also showed you. So here on the left hand side of the screen, you can see um, the experiments, the different experiments that we have. Um, you can click on a specific experiment. In this case, it's charcoal dry rot segmentation. And here on this panel, you can see the different simulations that we have. So here, uh, I'm gonna have a small uh, explanation about the difference between simulation and experiment because it might be a little bit uh, misleading. So <clears throat> each experiment is a general thing that you are doing. For example, you wanna do charcoal dry rot segmentation. And the simulations are the instances of uh, each of those model trainings, hyperparameter tuning, and so on and so forth. So here on this box, you can see uh, the detail, some, some detail about each of these simulation, the user that ran it, the name of the simulation, and um, other details, um, some parameters, some of the metrics, and so on and so forth. So what you can do here is to click in on one of the simulations. It takes you to another screen um, that gives you more information about that specific simulation. So here you can see uh, some of the basic information. As Artin mentioned, you can see the parameters. Um, so here I log a lot of different parameters. For example, you can see the details of the model, the loss function you use, the optimizer, batch size, the number of epochs, and so on and so forth. If you just scroll down a little bit here, you can see the, some of the metrics that you saved or um, the Keras autolog or MLflow autolog saved them for you. You can click on them, see the plot. And um, the most important thing in my case is uh, this, this artifact section. So here on the artifacts, um, for each of the simulation, you can save the model itself. You can save some of the, um, uh, like other um, files, such as the model summary, which shows you the structure of the model. You can save, um, if you wish, a specific graphs that represents um, the training of this specific uh, simulation. And also uh, something that is really helpful for us is these artifacts that basically they are a test case. So, in, in our project, in the charcoal dry rod, we want to see how the model, each of these models are doing on one specific test image uh, as a way to visually see if everything is working okay or not. So here, uh, I save these three images. They represent the, um, that test image. And also we can see the highlighted regions that they are segmented uh, regions that the model suggests are the affected, um, um, basically um, regions on the image that caused by the, the dry rot fungus. Um, another interesting option of MLflow uh, is this compare bottom. Uh, it gives you um, the power of comparing these models very easily. So previously before um, using MLflow, I was downloading all these experiments and visualizing the images one by one, visualizing the parameters one by one, it was really difficult. But here you can select, uh, say a number of these, um, for example, uh, simulations and press on the compare button. It takes you to this screen and visualizes the different um, like features of each simulation side by side. Here you can see the parameters, it highlights those regions that they are, um, different from one another. You can see the learning rate is different for these two simulations. Um, and you can um, scroll down a little bit. You can see different plots that you have. Um, if you save uh, metrics, you can see the metrics. You can click on them. It opens up for you side by side. And this is great for uh, simply comparing the results of your experiments. So. Um, let me go back now to the presentation. Um, okay. So um, during this, um, like working with MLflow, applying it on our project, I've learned some lessons and I faced some challenges, which I guess it's gonna be useful for you guys. 
Um, the first one is that, um, as Artin mentioned, setting up MLflow, it needs, uh, it needs you to set up a server and create a database, one of those SQL um, server or uh, Postgres or those other databases. So if you don't have um, a lot of experience doing that, it's going to be a little bit difficult. Um, and that's one of the downsides of MLflow. I mean, it's not a downside per se, but it's one of the challenges that you will definitely have to face. Um, and also another downside, I guess, of MLflow is the fact that um, comparing the artifacts at that comparison page I sh just showed you is not possible. So for example, in our case, it's really important for us to compare those two images for the two simulations and see um, which one is, for example, working on the edges of the affected regions and which, which of these models are not. And this is not possible uh, in the current version of MLflow. Maybe in the future, they add this uh, component. And another problem with MLflow is the auto lock. Um, in most cases, it works perfectly without any problems, but in some cases, it doesn't work and you need to manually log your parameters and metrics. I'm uh, pretty sure that Artin has some, um, uh, some, some other things that he wants to share with you about these challenges. So I let him uh, talk about it them himself. Artin, do you want me to yeah. share my screen or? Yes, please keep it. Okay. Thank you, Arjan. And yeah, just to add a few other uh, factors that I, faced and I've noticed uh, to what uh, Arian mentioned. Some of the things that you need to know in order to be able to in integrate MLflow into your work is that you need to know a certain prerequisites, be familiar with them. For example, if you want to use Conda or Docker or both, you need to be a little bit familiar with those and also SQL flavors and SSH tunneling. There is a, there was a dependency version mismatch that I, I had, we had a lot of problems with especially when the version of MLflow was changing, Postgres wanted to update their databases, which although it could be something that maybe there is a work around it, or I just didn't know enough about Postgres, or it could be that it is a problem with MLflow. And one other thing that could be really problematic is that it doesn't support singularity if you wanted to feed your container into the MLflow. And because uh, super computers like HPC only support singularity because of its security, uh, higher security supports, you won't be able to use MLflow. Although you could simply have your singularity container and run MLflow inside it, which is a whole different story. Uh, and uh, per, as Tina mentioned, if you like if you like this materials and MLflow and like to uh, use some of the cyber's infrastructure and their help, you could simply request an ECP, which is short for external collaborative partnerships. And if accepted, then they will help you with the infrastructure and also a lot more help with Postgres and some other so helps from the software side. And finally, these are some helpful resources in case you wanted to expand what you learned here and explore what, are, what is out there. Thank you very much for attending this webinar. We hope that what we discussed was beneficial to you and we didn't waste your time. Great, thank you Artin and thank you Ariane. Um, there's a couple of questions in the chat. People feel free to type your questions now. Uh, someone would like to know whether Neo J4 is compatible with MLflow or vice versa. I need to check that. I haven't seen that, so I don't know. Let me just double check, I guess, ask Google. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, I don't even I, know I, what Neo J4 is. Maybe um, the person who typed that question. question. I can see it. So yeah. I, I, I can't find it right now, but okay. maybe there is, I don't know. I didn't know that. I just, I guess, ask Google. Okay. And then another question about label box. Is that where images are stored? Um, no, um, that's a good question. Label box, uh, basically you need to store some version of those images in order to label them on the label box. But our main storage in Fight Oracle is Cyverse uh, data uh, store, uh, storage. 
So no. Okay. All right. My question was, I, I like that compare analysis function very well, much. How, how many analyses can you compare at a time or is it just two at one time? Uh, it's not just two, you can uh, compare multiple. Actually, I don't know what's the upper bound. Um, I guess it depends on the size of your screen, screen. or maybe MLflow has some boundary on that. Yeah, and just to add something to that, uh, Ariane showed you how you could use the, AP, the UI for the comparison. You could also use the API like inside Python or your R just to load the CSV files and then do comparisons, which in that case, obviously there is no limit. You could compare whatever you want. Great, thank you. Another question, what computer language should I learn to be able to efficiently work with MLflow? It, sort of the question, I guess, is the other way. What programming language you already know and then use and learn how to use MLflow with it? MLflow supports most of the famous ones. If you're in data science, it supports Python, R, Java, C++. So you need to see which one you're familiar with. And if you are more of a data scientist, data analysis, you probably need maybe more R. So go with that and then try to use MLflow with that. If you do more machine learning as if like model optimization, those kind of thing, maybe you want to do Python, then try to learn Python with MLflow. Depends on your needs. So that brings to mind a question that I would have, since it's about uh, coordinating and collaboration and being an assistive program with that, could different team members use different uh, programming languages to share the same data and analyses and experiments? Very interesting question. Possible? Yes, I haven't tried it, but yes, uh, theoretically, uh, because all MLflow does is to save it in a Postgres database, and the database doesn't really care what language you're using. Uh -huh. So theoretically, yes, you should be able to use multiple different languages with the same database. And also because it's on the same database, use it on the same UI. Okay, great. Um, how does MLflow compare to other open source ML versioning tools like DVC? I personally checked DVC a little bit. I didn't like it. It, it was not as intuitive. It was a lot of command lines. Uh, MLflow seemed a lot more user friendly. Um, all, but that being said, obviously I haven't used DVC a lot in my own work, so I can't really be a good judge there. It's just a simple comparison that I've worked MLflow, but not as much with DVC. Just, I didn't like how it wasn't as user friendly for me. Okay. Another question, how does MLflow optimize machine learning training at scale on distributed resources, for example, HPC, OSG, or cloud? Uh, MLflow doesn't. And there, there is one thing called Kubeflow that might help you with that, but this form with Cybers that we just mentioned, they have a Kubernetes cluster that if you have those needs, you could simply collaborate with them and they will help you to use MLflow with their clusters and so be able to scale. Okay, uh, there's a comment. I found the comparison tool to be one of the most useful ones. Knowing artifacts uh, cannot be compared really disappointed me. Is there any alternative to compare artifacts instead of doing it the, the difficult conventional way that you know of? Uh, well, for, for the artifacts, you can't compare them in the UI, but you always have the API option. And by API, I mean, let's say you're using Python, you could just load your artifact inside Python, and then you write your own code. You have to obviously write a few lines of code. You need to be familiar with like Patplotlib or those visualization libraries. But then if you are, then you could just do whatever you want. Although it'll be like, it won't be much ML flow, it will be like, the only point of MLflow there would be that you know which exact run simulation ID you need and take the exact model or artifact that you're looking for. And then you can do the comparison inside your own script or Jupyter Notebook. Okay, thank you. Ariane, do you have anything else to add to, to what uh, Arkin's? Uh, no, I just see that uh, uh, Sina has raised his hand. So I guess maybe he has a question. Okay. Yeah, Sina, um, you can unmute if you'd like to ask your question or feel free to type it into the chat. Or did yeah. you have a comment? 
Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm kind of new to MLflow. I've started using it. I saw that uh, you mentioned that you can share your models with MLflow easily. But uh, since I've been using it, I've saw that I have to use like password, username, and uh, to get to that point to be able to access that, uh, that model. So my question is, I don't want to share my password and username to anyone else. How can I share the model without sharing those kind of stuff? Yeah, uh, we're actually like working on the same issue right now. There is this thing called, you probably were talking about the model registry, right? Yes, yes. So like in, in our case, we're using SSH tunneling for it. And in SSH tunneling, there is a thing, the public SSH key. You can, you can produce a public key and then share that with everybody else's so that they don't, they wouldn't need a, your password and username. I, I'm still on the process of making that work. I haven't finished it, but that is the, that is the path. Thank okay. you. Thank you. If there's any other questions, feel free to type them in the chat. In the meantime, um, I'll just let people know that in two weeks on April 30th, we have our final spring webinar. Dr. Ray Enke of James Madison University will demonstrate his classroom tested app that he developed to teach students core elements of next gen sequencing quality control analysis. And he's managed to figure out a way to use emojis. So uh, please join us then same time two weeks from today. And so thank you, Artin and Ariane. Really appreciate uh, hearing about how MLflow uh, has worked for both your projects and um, that uh, it is a tool that will help collaborative work uh, with large data sets, which is what Cybers is all about. So we'll add this video recording to our webinar pages and you guys can check that out at any time. Thanks everyone, we'll see you back in two weeks. Thank you, Ariane. Thank you, Artin. <laughs>